Okay, uh, I think we're live. So hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the uh, roundtable discussion on heterotopias at Ars Electronica. We are uh, various different members of Interactive, Interactive Architecture Lab. And um, today we're going to be talking about this term heterotopias, what it means for our design practice, um, and how we can include uh, some of this discussion um, in moving our work forward. We, it's come out of discussions that have happened over the course of this year um, of us as students and uh, staff um, thinking around the kinds of situations and issues that we've been facing in this uh, pandemic era. Um, and uh, through Journal Club, which was something that we did amongst students to discuss various academic texts and other discussions, we've um, come across this term heterogeneous through the work of others. It was originally taken from Michel Foucault's text of other spaces, Utopias and Heterotopias, written in 1967. Um, it's a very interesting topic, but it is a little bit tricky to get your head around. Um, and we've positioned this discussion um, to try and investigate what it means um, with relation to other uh, topics, um, our own design work, um, and utopias and dystopias. So utopias and dystopias are concepts that people will be familiar with already from various works of fiction and film, um, utopias being these kind of fictional sites um, of happiness and good things, and dystopias, these also fictional sites of these strange other places that are bad, so uh, problematic or um, have some kind of technological issues with them. Heterotopias are other spaces that exist, however, so things that actually exist alongside our world in parallel to our world or things that we can observe. Um, and we're going to get a little bit of a discussion on how people have interpreted the term heterotopias with relation to their own work. I'd like to just start by getting the panel to introduce themselves um, and uh, say a little bit about what their role is and um, who they are. So Tung, would you like to start us off? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Stephen. So hi, everyone. My name is Tung, and I'm originally from Vancouver, Canada. Um, I'm a current student um, on the DFPI program here at UCL. Um, and my recent thesis has been exploring this concept of the Planthropocene and going on this process of unlearning these pillars of miscomprehension. Lovely, thank you. And Kevin, would you like to say something about uh, your role as well? Sure, I'm a senior teaching fellow uh, and also a researcher in immersive media. Lovely, thank you. Abel, could you give us a little introduction to yourself? Uh, my name is Abel, I'm also a student at DFBI. Uh, for my thesis, I've been looking into the concept of the queer ontology, and I've been using that within the works of VR, and right now I'm working on uh, wearable technologies. Lovely. Fiona? Hello, um, I'm Fiona. I'm one of the lecturers on design performance and interaction. I am half British, half Austrian, so I'd also like to say hello an alle unsere österreichischen Zuschauer. Wir freuen uns, dass ihr heute mit dabei seid und hoffentlich gibt es was Interessantes für euch. Um, I also teach the history and theory module together with Kevin for DFPI, and this is where a lot of this conversation emerged from. Lovely, thank you very much. Mahalia? Uh, hello, yeah, my name is Mahalia. Um, I'm also um, a student on the DFPI course. Uh, I have a background in architecture, performance and music, and I'm kind of really interested in mashing all these things together. Uh, my thesis was looking at this quality of our interactions that I feel we've kind of lost um, in the pandemic. And I've just been kind of really interested in this, in exposing and picking apart um, what it means to exist now in this new era. Perfect, thank you. And Rory, could you say something a little bit as well? Hi, I'm Uri Glenn. I'm the director of the Interactive Architecture Lab, where the Masters in Design for Performance and Interaction is based. I'm uh, very delighted to have this opportunity to be part of Ars Electronica. Um, and every year we bring our students to the festival, and this is a slightly different one, of course, this year. But you can see behind you, um, there's this wonderful virtual world uh, that's actually a hub that we had built by members of the lab uh, that, if, that invites the public from around the world to be able to actually travel around um, and, uh, uh, and a, a series of virtual galleries that show work of our students, work of various labs, some of our partners. Um, so there's a variety of projects. So while we're talking, you'll be able to actually see us moving around 
um, this virtual world. And, and it's an open invitation to you to uh, visit our hub, come and see the work. Uh, all of our students uh, work in proge progress work is there and also some of our uh, research projects are there. So uh, welcome to that. I hope you join us and, um, and you'll see a little bit of it in the background as well. Back to you, Stephen. Lovely, thank you, Rui. Um, so yeah, my name is Stephen. Um, I'm also one of the students on the Design for Performance and Interactive uh, Interaction course at the Interactive Architecture Lab. Um, and uh, I'd like to kick us off with a little bit of um, an explanation of uh, how I've come to understand heterotopias, and then we'll go into uh, everybody's understandings. At the end of um, us hearing from everybody, we'd like to open it up to some questions. So if you are uh, watching us on the YouTube stream, you can write your, uh, your questions in the comment section there. And um, we've also got Michael Wagner and Amy Johnson running the whole show. Um, and they're going to be uh, trying to uh, send some of those questions through to us so that we can um, answer them hopefully in this kind of second part of this discussion. So um, the way that I have come to understand the idea of heterotopias is through my background um, in also architecture, uh, but also in um, theatre and set design. Um, and my work previously had been looking at the work of Henri Lefebvre um, and the production of space. And I think um, Edward Sojar's third space, which uh, was work that was building on the work of Henri Lefebvre, um, sets us up for a discussion about heterotopias quite nicely, especially with reference to the kind of architectural sphere. Um, just to give you a very brief rundown of what third space is, uh, he proposes that there are first, second, and third space. Um, for, uh, he gives an example, or there is an example rather, of uh, the market as well. So in the first space, uh, the market would be something uh, that has a geographical location. It has logic, uh, it exists in some actual area. Um, and it could also be things like maps. It's the logic that defines spaces. Um, the second space, would be things like conceptualizations of those spaces or representations of those spaces. So for instance, in the example of the market, it would be something like uh, the notion of the market as a place to buy and sell goods or art that is made or images that are produced of it. And then this third space is the one that really relates to heterotopias. This one talks about the social connections um, uh, between market goers, how they actually interact, and the experiences and relations and systems that are happening uh, in this uh, particular space. Heterotopias, though, really has to do with this other term. Um, and I think, uh, Tung, the work that you've been doing has a real uh, link to this uh, way of understanding heterotopias, not just through this purely human lens. So I wondered if you might like to talk us through a little bit about what you think about heterotopias. Yeah, so just very quickly, um, I first came across this term, the planthropocene, um, when I was reading Natasha Meyer's essay, Photosynthesis, where she describes a collaborative era where we, you know, we must become allies with green beings, these photosynthetic beings, simply because, um, as she says, we cannot mitigate anthropocenic violence using anthropocenic logics. So at the same time, we had been discussing heterotopias, and I started relating these sites of growth, like gardens, as being heterotopic. So I think what's interesting is that um, sites of growth also implies the factor of time. Um, and I want to make two points in considering these anthropocenic logics. And so as my project mate Lynn and myself are working, um, we're trying to practice this by looking at boundaries that have been set in terms of something like the idea of technology. Um, so to illustrate this, consider something like the wood white web. Um, we all know it's a very communicative system between sentient beings like trees, fungi, insects. Um, it's definitely forms of technologies that humans have recognized, especially in the past decades. But where does this leave all these other forms of technology that we as humans don't have the faculties to comprehend, to understand? Um, and just another quick point in learning about these sites of growth and thinking about our logics is looking at this through history. So many of these sites of growth were built on you know, theft of ethnobotanical knowledge, uh, much of what we're familiar with, you know, the Anthropocene, has also been built on a foundation of, for example, stealing and smuggling plant species from other sites of growth, you know, like cotton varieties from India or breadfruit from Tahiti. 
Um, so somewhere like, you know, Kew Gardens became a site of growth for colonial powers. Um, and I think this is where the idea of heterotopia could be really interesting in discussions. I completely agree. I think it's a really urgent conversation. I think the way of framing it around um, uh, these non-human um, uh, sites or other sites is a really important thing as well. And we were having a discussion, I know, about the difference between kind of othering and an other and the other, which I think is really pertinent, especially in the kind of uh, scenes that we're seeing globally uh, at the moment. And Kevin, I know that um, you as Tung's uh, supervisor were helping to have this discussion about uh, non-human or um, other things. So I wondered if you might like to say something about that. Sure. Uh, um, Tung's uh, thesis is a really good example of um, seeing things from a, a larger perspective or from different perspectives. And this idea of heterotopias is really about uh, what we started talking about uh, at the beginning of the year, really, the academic year, uh, different realities and how uh, individuals can sort of inhabit um, separate subjective realities at the same time. And and so heterotopias is really about this idea of having different spaces or realities uh, in one space. Um, so when you bring sort of, um, when you expand that to include non-humans, that means um, not regarding the environment um, or other things as a sort of static backdrop to human activities or as a sort of standing reserve of materials for production or accumulation. Um, so part of that is also about time and um, thinking of a thing not as a static uh, fixed thing, even humans, uh, but I think Foucault says something about um, a things, you can regard a thing as a sort of point in its movement, not as, as a static thing, just as stability is sort of movement in infinitely slowed down. Um, so this is a sort of relational space, um, it's relations between things, and then space, he says, uh, takes the form of relations be between sites, so relating it back to architecture. Um, yeah. Lovely, thank you. Yeah, I think it's a really important um, notion and, and you're talking about these sites that in some way have a kind of existence alongside or within or around um, these spaces that we naturally inhabit. I know, um, Abel, your work has looked at um, uh, queer spaces um, and also VR a bit as well, so maybe you can discuss something to do with uh, this, the, the other and um, the notion of actually creating new spaces rather than just pointing at them like the marketplace. Yeah, I think it's what's really potent about the concept of heterotopias is that it's not just, um, it is about this other space, right? And especially within the notion of queer, this othering of yourself or the othering of groups of people is, is a, a real issue. It's, it's a real thing that plays. And the power for me, like the heterotopia, is that it, what, uh, happens is that it says, no, there's something that exists outside of the dystopia utopia narrative. And Ursula Le Guin, in some of her writing, has really potently described that this uh, utopic thinking is still so strongly dominated through whiteness and through maleness. And I think heterotopias offers us a chance to, to break that kind of dominant logic, that normalization of certain types of bodies, of certain types of spaces, and engaging with these from this layered thinking where throughout society, these heterotopias can act as counter sites. And especially in VR, uh, I think uh, a lot of stuff that I've, I've researched uh, comes from the 90s, where there was definitely also a different attitude towards VR. I'm, I'm seeing it return a bit, which, which I'm excited about. But oftentimes, the VR spaces then were really considered as these transformative spaces, as these spaces that could uh, bring societal and personal change. And in that were kind of Margaret Morse compares them to the old sweat lodges. And these are also the Foucault's heterotopias of crisis, where you go to change and become new and, and get into a different kind of dialogue with your existing identity within society. So for me, that's where also the kind of queerness of space uh, becomes a very important factor. 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, I completely agree. I know, Fiona, you've also been working with uh, VR in your practice and also looking at some of these um, really urgent questions around um, queerness and uh, the other or another. Um, maybe you could also follow up because I know your practice also has en engaged mm. with architecture and with the body. And mm. yeah. Well, I, I guess that the, the key thing is in, in my own interest that um, it all revolves around cognition and it kind of re relates back to what um what kevin was saying about the relationality and this is a kind of a spatial and temporal rel relationality across many different constituent parts so where all, kind of everything is other and that in the cognitive sense um all of this of uh, cognition arises as this relationality always kind of in in flux rather than as a static thing and so in our understanding of the world, it is not just that we, we kind of emerge our own consciousness ourselves in one space, but it is always done in relation to, kind of, to many others. So it's not just something that is in our own body, but it's indeed something that is embedded, kind of enacted, effective, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the other thing that I'd like to say in this, which kind of relates also to what the points that Abel was making indirectly is the question of the, the in-between which is the, kind of the threshold space, the liminal, which is a space for growth, a space for change. This is a kind of an uncertainty that comes to it, which again ties back to the heterotopia, which is not clearly defined. It is not a space of kind of, you know, the positive, the negative, as the utopia, the dystopia, but the heterotopia always allows this kind of uncertainty, which is very fruitful, allows plurality to emerge. So I think that that's something really valuable to kind of push to the forefront, but we must allow also this kind of not knowing and fear it. This is something that speaking about the body and the body in space and where we are right now in the world is something that we're kind of we're desperate for understanding and having a certain amount of certainty. And I think that this is something that if we consider that um, from the other point of view and say if we actually already embed the uncertainty into our expectation, into our cognitive kind of understanding of what's happening, we'll be much more um, equipped to actually deal with the kind of the, the wickedness of the whole situation that we're in where kind of transformation things that that need to happen we're more willing to to embrace we're not we don't have preconceived ideas of this is what must happen where we're going into the whole thing saying where we don't know what happens so we'll be much more agile and on our feet and i think again the heterotopia is something that's quite um quite interesting here i'm actually going to turn around now the whole thing and ask you a question stephen because i know that in your work you were looking a lot at the notion of anti-fragility which is something that very much fits into this in that actually a space of heterotopia is an anti-fragile space and it is one that will allow us to, to kind of, if we think about this we need to build an anti-fragile system rather than a robust system uh, how might that equip us to deal with this wicked problem that the pandemic for example right now is and actually to be true there's many many more wicked problems that we're that, that we're facing in this kind of ecological state of emergency that we're in, which includes the climate, includes social, it includes political, it includes kind of cultural questions, and all of these have been touched on. And I just want to stress the point that all of this is indeed entangled. We can't see them as separate from each other. So I completely agree. And I think it's the it's the biggest issue that we've got uh, facing us is the fact that, I mean, there's a lot of uh, writing on precariousness, for example. Um, and I like the, the the use of the word agility um, in, in, in the face of these difficulties, because I think it, it is about that. I mean, anti-fragility is something that Mahalia and I have been looking at in our work. Um, but actually, there's this kind of strangeness to um, anti-fragility that Yes, anti-fragility is better than robustness because it gives you an adaptability that can change you in the face of kind of difficulty. But it also has these kind of um, slightly problematic neoliberal connections. Um, and I think for me, especially coming out of um, reading Henri Lefebvre and Soja and, you know, a lot of... Um, kind of relatively heavy duty um, leftist authors I think that it's I think it's quite an important discussion to have where uh, anti-fragility has this still notion of competition or about um, winning or um, Mahalia and I were talking about this in in our project as well in, in fact Mahalia maybe I can bring you in here as well because I think um, this discussion about uh, strangeness um, and familiarity and actually 
COVID has sort of presented us with an opportunity to have these discussions in a way that weren't, wasn't possible before. Um, Abel's been talking about VR, um, but I know that through the work that we've done together and what you've been looking at, there's XR spaces, these mixed reality spaces, and somehow we need to kind of embed this strangeness or this um, oddness, not, as, not, not seeing it as a kind of um, deviance or as a bad thing, but in some way that's kind of interesting or that we want. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it's really, I think the, it's difficult to say the good thing about the pandemic because we're also still in it and it's also been traumatic and terrible, uh, obviously. But I think the, the benefit of the situation that we're in is that suddenly we all really had to kind of uh, grapple with uh, kind of disorder disruption chaos and like uncertainty like on a daily basis we just don't know what's going to happen every day and um i think that's really i think it's a really uh, valuable thing because it really offers us the opportunity to to reimagine and so a lot of the work that i was doing for the thesis and in the project has been looking at uh what is this kind of reimagined world and how do we step into this like new this new reality and i think that's really um, that's an exciting um, opportunity that's kind of been offered by the pandemic is a way to be like to really see that systems or structures don't have to remain uh, solid. We can we can reform them and we can um, yeah we can subvert we can transform we can grow and that's that's super exciting. Um, yeah, I mean I could talk about this for a very long time. And I think as well in. You know, no, yeah, and I think I think in in the thesis uh, that I was writing as well, it was to do with um, constraints and actually about creativity being able to be produced by the existence of some constraints. Um, so uh, rather than about um, subversion, uh, people like Ian Borgost are talking about submitting and finding constraints and then utilizing those constraints to produce new, interesting, novel, creative, whatever approaches. Um, and I think that all of us to some extent in this pandemic, in this room, in this virtual space, but also outside of it, everyone that's watching and just anybody really actually in their in their private homes and their private lives has had to in some way make this kind of adaptation. Um, and this kind of like, uh, this this idea of making the familiar strange, I think, is a is a really important one. You know, you're sitting in the same room working from home for what five months now. Uh, suddenly, that table in front of you or that wall, in a kind of George Perec way, starts to dissolve and be just something completely different. Um, I think maybe Rory, this is a perfect uh, time to to get your opinion on it because obviously the way that the course has shifted now to having to adapt to being online presents us with the opportunity to do all sorts of new different and exciting things other things um, and it also gives us some kind of flexibility but there's no denying also that we've lost some things and that it's been kind of quite difficult so maybe you'd like to speak on um, yeah what the, how the course has had to evolve well i just i will and i, I just to begin by saying that the, the i've been thinking about this the word constraints now since you meant since it got brought up and i it, it is an interesting word in, in 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 relation to architecture we're based at the school of architecture and the word constraint is a very commonly used word because effectively when we design space we're talking a lot about the immediate environmental constraints and so on right but actually the constraints that we're dealing with here are to use another word mentioned earlier deeply entangled right they're not they're not spatial they're not physically spatial right they actually are other types of spatial notions um time-based notions and then and, and the complexity of relationships that we are facing as designers now uh whether it's technological or social whatever it may be coming from are much much um, yeah, just much, much more complex and um, and difficult to pull apart and, and look at in the way that sort of traditional architectural design might look at a site and be like, I can see the site, I can see the constraints that, that I'm designing with. So this is an interesting time because I feel like a lot of new constraints are being revealed to us um, th that have to do with climate, to do with health, to do with notions of gender and so on and identity. There's a lot of things that are being, that are bubbling up right now. And I think certainly in the context of a program like ours, we 
political issues to do with urbanization, to do with social issues about housing, whatever it might be, all of those things going on. And then these other more human social interaction um, uh, issues. So it's an enormous subject and no distinct discipline is really uh, in a position to be able to, to deal with this. So the question is, how do you deal or design for heterotopias? How do you engage with it as a subject matter? And the, the media art world has actually been a really important community. Tars Electronica has been a really important community in developing transdisciplinary practices that allow for an engagement of a set of different issues that are across traditionally defined disciplinary boundaries. So it's, it's a really, so the purpose of the, the program that we've developed at the Bartlett um, uh, within the School of Architecture is to actually create a melting pot for people coming from backgrounds in art and science technology. Uh, so the, the people in this room, I'm just looking at all you guys, I think maybe half of you had some sort of architectural training background, but you also come from backgrounds in uh, neuroscience and backgrounds in performance and production and um, Tongue, remember, remind me what your background was. I'm just trying to remember now for a second. Just fine arts. And from the fine arts as well, right? So, uh, so, and some of you are working in performance context, in in live coding, and so on. So, this kind of variety of characters that are coming together into a space is an attempt by us to create a environment to develop transdisciplinary research, to be able to engage with all of the things that have been brought up here, um, and traditional just to kind of summarize traditional disciplinary institutions, the art school, the fine art department, the architecture school traditionally, the, or, or indeed the, the, the computer science department can't deal with the problems that we're discussing very effectively. And it demands these new kinds of uh, spaces. So in, in, for me, just to, to finish, would be that this notion of um, heterotopias for me is about creating physical representations or kind of approximations of a utopia. It's about having a very, and I think this comes from working with students and young people is there's a very, there's still a very positive, ambitious, um, you know, perspective from, from young people coming up, seeing a world that is full of chaos. Um, and I think our role is to develop sort of physical representations to develop new kinds of futures um, that sort of challenge a fairly dismal and dystopic kind of space that we're currently in. Yeah, I think I think it's um, it's a good way for um, people to generally understand how we as designers might be approaching um, the the production of work uh, with response to this topic. And I think it's important to note that this, that um, what's quite exciting about the idea of a heterotopia as opposed to a utopia is the fact that it gives us the opportunity to go other rather than to go kind of um, um, full pie in the sky dream kind of thing. And somehow that makes it actually more tangible or it makes it something that we can engage with on a day to day basis and that we can take ownership of. And we're not the, the problem with the utopia is it's always unattainable because its, it's definition is that it's always in the future, it's always a non-real space, we can never really get there. Whereas heterotopia opens us up to this option of exploring these unknown things, about investigating them, sometimes with academic rigor, sometimes with some kind of uh, performativity, sometimes with some kind of, um, I don't know, uh, non-human investigations like placing things into the bottom of a river and seeing what happens to them. All of those kinds of things uh, uh, kind of uh, produce um, these uh, heterotopias as well as just point at them, which I think is the kind of key thing in the 21st century um, to kind of um, get away from is this idea that all the questions, all these easy questions of like, where are the edges have just been discussed for years and years and years now and all these boundaries are much more blurred it's much more complex it's much more intertwined so i think your focus on the idea of transdisciplinarity is a really important one yeah. kevin just quickly I, I mean if people have questions on the youtube um uh chat please start typing them now because we're going to get around to them soon um but uh, kevin I, I know that your work has been um through uh, also creative research. And so I wondered if you might like to speak a little bit about um, how we might be able to just turn these things from like a discussion in a virtual space to um, thinking about how we can actually uh, start to 
make work or produce work or engage with it and then maybe everybody else if you have some thoughts on that feel free to jump in and start um, start the discussion but yeah Kevin over to you okay um well uh sort of following up what uh, Rory said you know the course is designed for performance and interaction and uh, we started out the year sort of questioning all of those terms you know what is design and who designs um, and what are we designing for whom and for what reasons um, and for example, in Tung's thesis, you know, she explored this idea that, well, design is also a sort of um, process undertaken by nature, for example. Uh, and then we can think of performance and interaction, and you know, those have specific uh, definitions within architecture, but we can apply them equally to other areas, you know, who or what performs in what ways, and what does interaction mean? So, you know, um, the course, I think, really, this is a great example, this, this whole session, because um, it's taking what you guys have done, the students uh, taking, you know, theory and put it into practice. So we, we work in both directions, I think. You know, we conceptualize our practice as research, and of course we do research that then informs the practice. And really, you know, you're creating, like you could say designing the future, but in a way we're designing these alternate realities, these heterotopias um, that operate alongside each other. Um, and when you bring in, you know, other set of actors, um, then you get away from human-centric things like language, human languages, and think about how we relate to each other with regard to experience, you know, bodily experience, gesture, and so forth. Um, and uh, like Rory said, I think uh, making the familiar strange um, um, and uh, creating these other spaces like we've been talking about. Lovely. Yeah, thank you. I think it's I think it's uh it's it is a difficult one because it's it's how how we can turn uh something that seems kind of like um futuristic or um intangible in some way into something that's uh, actually designable but i like your example of uh, design being something that's done by nature as well and i think actually one thing that's uh, uh, really interesting um that came up for me when I was doing my research was this idea of just reframing the designer. We've had this whole um, uh, idea in the 20th century of the designer as kind of like a problem solver. You know, you give them a problem, they come up with a solution for it. Or um, and, and historically, that's also been set in some ways the difference between how people think about design and, and art um, and, and how there's a client or there's a brief that you're working towards. But I know that in um, my work especially, I've tried to come to understand design not as a, a kind of um, this role of top-down, here's the solution kind of thing, um, but actually it was a book that Abel lent me at some point, um, which was uh, talking about Liz Lerman's practice and thinking about it more as like a dramaturge, so somebody that actually facilitates discussions, uh, somebody that actually uh, produces this kind of ongoing body of work um, and is engaging with it at either in the devising room or, yeah, in various different scenarios. Abel do you, do you remember the text I'm talking about first of all? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I want to jump on how actually it's facilitating, I think, is a prime example of how the heterotopia can function as a way to like guide our design. But if we think of the heterotopia as enacting some kind of utopic thinking, if it is about inversion of other real sites, then it's really the heterotopia facilitating uh, the process of designing for, um, for a different future. And I, I think what I really like and, and always <laughs> like to touch upon is that um, I, I love Ursula Gwynn and her writing on utopia because she so like boils down how that utopic thinking is not good for us because it denies a certain history. It uh, is this non-real space. And what it does is that uh, she says in a non-Euclidean view of California as a cold place to be, amazing title, amazing text, uh, read it. Um, she writes how the utopia is about progress, but never about process. And I think as designers in the now, we should really concern ourselves with the process of how we are working, with whom we're working, like who has a seat at the table. And these are also like the non-human actors. Yeah, I think I? that's some, some really poignant things that Kevin and Chang have uh, brought on. 
can I just say, Abel, I think that's, I completely agree with you. And I think that's one of the things that we've tried to do with our program. And you, you can see the work in the exhibition as well. It's all about making things. So it is all about process. Um, there is this, you know, this just ambition to iterate and iterate and test and build. And actually ours is always a very important exhibition for us that we attend because it's our chance to take a lot of work out into the, into the real world, which is an interesting word in the context of heterotopies, of course, and to, to actually see what the public, you know, in fact, probably the most literate, digit, like media art literate community you could possibly present work to. And, and see what the responses are to, and actually actualizing, representing, representing ideas in physical artifacts, and this iterative process is, is, is at the heart of, I think, the way that we're trying to work. Um, and I don't know if any of you guys have got any, anything to say about how your, you know, these things you've been reading and writing about particularly uh, have, have actually influenced the way that you're working actually as designers. That's a bit of an open question to you. But I'd be really interested to hear how you think it might have influenced the way you're thinking about the design work that you're doing. Yeah, I know Mahalia and I have had some real struggles with that switch from physical to digital and about how it can actually um, uh, continue to be about process, about how we can how we can uh, make that process visible, about how we can um, investigate in new and interesting ways. Um, I don't know, Mahalia, would you like to jump in as well? Because this really frames the whole idea that uh, that we've been talking about, about mixed reality, about why it's important to still have these elements of haptic or tactile or, yeah, messy or any of that yeah. stuff. Um... Yeah, it's really interesting because it was just not, it wasn't, we always had this life that was uh, uh, happening simultaneously digitally, but, but suddenly to be kind of in isolation and have no way of really fulfilling these physical in, interpersonal interactions, suddenly you just really, this difference becomes really stark. Um, and so, yeah, me and Stephen often would just uh, be having a call about our project, but really unable to communicate, even though we're saying words, but it's just uh, something is just like not uh, being able to be communicated. So yeah, I was, for my thesis, I was looking into this quality of uh, messiness, uh, which is basically a term that I've kind of put to this quality of physical interactions and this way that when we are with people, we, we can kind of feed off of this energy, this kind of uh, body language, uh, I was looking into affect theory, this idea that when we're around people, we are able to kind of sense and um, understand and communicate things that we are not even necessarily consciously thinking about. Um, and so now in our project, we're trying to think about ways in which we can still have those kinds of messy interactions, even if we are kind of um, dislocated in our, um, in our locations and we are separate and how can we form these bonds and how can we feel together even though we are now very separate often yeah lovely and i think i think i think it's a really urgent question because it looks like this isn't going away really very soon you know um and and even if it does in a way uh there's been a lot of discussion around the idea of uh returning to normal versus the new normal um people are suddenly finding out that um actually things can be done from home uh, i saw a really interesting post uh this morning uh from the green party which i don't know if some of you may have seen it um which is uh, uh showing that um or asking people to sort of demand that they can have uh, four day weeks that they can continue to work from home for as long as possible that they get to spend more time with their family mm -hmm. and that they get to have lunches and meals that they cook at home that are actually nice and all this kind of thing but there is something really really um uh important that is going to kind of disappear from that discussion if we just switch over to um these kind of um you know 22nd century pods these things from like 1960s sci-fi where we're all just like uh i don't know plugged into the matrix for want of a better word so there i think there is something really important about that about this 90s discussion about cybernetics and and um uh, 
cyber feminism and all of that kind of stuff. And then there's a real need to kind of get back into that subject matter and and update it in a way that is um, that they could never have seen coming in some ways. You know, it, 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 it never before was something that we had to deal with. It was always something that was this extra layer or that was, oh, yeah, we should engage more with this. But now it's it's been forced upon us. So, yeah, I think it's really, really important. We just had some questions come in, and I kind of think that the first question is one that we um, can relatively uh, well fit in with what the two of you, Stephen and Mahalia, have just been discussing. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you want me to read the question, it's in our chat. Um, yeah, the question Sorry, that's coming is, uh, in Austria, the Minister of Immigration has recently stated that we don't want secondary societies, and the person asking saying, I'm not sure if I'm translating it correctly, but I'm, I'm, I'm guessing what is meant is that it's... Um, you know, immigrants coming into Austria, forming their own communities, and not integrating, um, to hinder an integration with that immigration. Do you think that, that your work, Heterotopian Design, could be a guide to fuse that bridge? And I kind of get the feeling that what you've just been discussing about this kind of the kind of levels of experience, levels of existence, where you have this kind of feeling of separation. Um, and in, in the case that you were describing from your own experience doing your work, where suddenly a certain amount of meaning, you were being robbed of that because you felt completely displaced, in a sense. I think that that is one that potentially could open up a conversation about the, the, the political aspects that have been ongoing. I completely, I completely you... agree. Yeah. I, 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 sorry to cut you off. I, I, I just was before I forget it. I think, I think it's, I think it's um, a really important discussion to bring back to that because it's, it's not just these design tasks that we're creating as some kind of like um, fantastical vision for an alternate reality. You know, um, there's there's, there's important discussions around things like Occupy London and Occupy Wall Street or the um, migrant camp at Calais or all of these kinds of spaces that are denoted as um, other spaces and oftentimes that happens from a point of view of a uh, power structure. So, um, you know, the, the, the migrant camp at Calais suddenly becomes somewhere where people are othered um, and it doesn't become what actually uh, Occupy London was seen as, which was done by predominantly um, white affluent people, whereas it's uh, in, in, in the context of Occupy, it's like um, it's a prefigurative tool for change. It's people um, setting up a situation where they can actually uh, have their own, you know, bartering system and they can live there on privately owned public space and all that kind of thing. And so I think it's really important to get into this discussion about like how we can start to be producing um, spaces is where we have control over them. And I think this whole discussion is showing us that that 20th century definition of space as something that's delineated by lines or geometry is just really old fashioned now. And it's, and it's a really important time to start thinking about how um, we can start integrating other spaces and how that can become part of our everyday conversations. Um, I know telling this uh, this discussion about um, ethnobotany and uh, the power structures in, around that, I think it's a really important one to kind of get into on that line as well. I wonder if you had something to say about it too. Yeah, so um, I recently read this article about a woman kind of describing her mum's um, garden and what that means to her at different stages um, of her life. and not being familiar with the garden because she's at a different stage of her life. And so I think, um, you know, there has been a lot of discussions about, for example, names of plants. Um, where did they originate from this idea of a plant being native to, um, for example, uh, the UK, so like the hydrangea, but actually it's um, something, you know, uh, it's a species that originated from China and Japan. Um, and so I think these ideas of um, names, um, recognizing where these um, you know, species are coming from, for example, um, and the connotation of the name, who names it, um, are all discussions that um, we should consider. And especially during lockdown, you know, the ideas of parks, public parks, and these public green spaces, um, who actually has access to these spaces. Not everyone has their own private garden. Um, and so these are all, I think, areas um, that we can look at heterotopia too. 
Completely agree. And and there was a point as well um, that came up when Fiona was talking earlier about this idea of the threshold. In this um, initial discussion, I don't know if I uh, mentioned it already, but in this initial discussion of the definition of heterotopia that Foucault has, um, uh, there's this there's this point um there's kind of six principles of the heterotopias and one of these points is heterotopias are not freely accessible but presuppose a system of opening and closing so there's already in the 60s a discussion about the fact that there's kind of um limited access to these heterotopias but also in some ways this is what gives them uh kind of their own power actually because they're able to produce these um layered uh, experiences. Uh, with, there's another question in the links to this. I've seen uh, uh, Bob Wiss's question, but I'm going to just quickly touch on Patrick O'Neill's question because I think it um, links to what we're talking about right now. Patrick says, in times when increasingly revolutionary actions are being called for, how can heterotopic thinking help us navigate forward in ways utopic thinking cannot? Uh, and what ways might people actually resist such a shift? I think the second part of that, um, in some ways, I think the first part of that question we've touched upon already, but the second part of that question, I think, is really important. People resisting this idea of us presenting strange other spaces, you know, these are uncomfortable things. They're not things that we're going to love straight away. So so how can we how can we involve that in the way that we consider our design work? Does anybody else, anybody want to answer it? I mean, I have a few thoughts, but maybe somebody else would like to jump in. I, I um, The question from Patrick, I think my, my, my answer is going to be similar to what I said earlier on, but I think it, I would just like to reaffirm it because I think it's at the heart of what we're trying to do here at, at uh, Interactive Architecture Lab, which is the way to navigate kind of utopias I, or utopic ideas is to actually build them and to take them out of the utopia, which is this kind of space that doesn't exist, into a space that does exist, and in doing so to get a tangible understanding of them. Um, and that's what I think all of you guys are doing with your projects right now, is you, I think you're all uh, po trying to positively engage with problems or seeing solutions or better possibilities out there, but trying to see how you might be able to get to them. Whether we get to them in the time that we have here is, not, is, is one thing but actually being able to get a tangible sense of what works and what doesn't work is the difference, I think, between the heterotopia in some respects and, and then the utopia, which is always beyond reach and, you know, untastable, untouchable, right? And um, so I think that's the, that's, that would be my response to that, to that particular question. It, it, it's, it's a very difficult thing to actually achieve. Yeah, it is the idea of utopia actually, real is utopia only existing in method and practice, not as a destination, or a, a site, but really only through what we're doing. And I think what's the beauty about the heterotopic thinking that allows us to bring that site into our real world and see how it might be reflected in space we already know, space we already engage with. I think also in regards to the question, uh, a question earlier that came in on the uh, Google uh, about the heterotopia, I think the question about Austria, that was it. Um, I think the heterotopia allows us to question where all these worlds are in, again, in the relationship to each other. So we're not talking about the first or the second world. We're talking about all these worlds overlaying each other, interacting with each other and seeing where that entanglement might lead us. And I think utopic vision tries to bring one unified blueprint of what the future should be and working within the heterotopia allows us to see like this entanglement. And that entanglement is complex and entanglement is messy and uh, unsightly at points. And I think that's where, where the resistance lies. It's why uh, certain conspiracy theories, certain politicians are very, without getting, no, I am going to get political. Uh, what I think is wrong right now in the world is that kind of boiling down to a single utopic vision. Uh, right now, in preparation for the Dutch elections, I see a lot of politicians being choose for me because I'm not the current government and the current government will lead us to shit. So it's very much always this uh, either dystopia, either utopia. And I think the heterotopia tries to bridge that. But the utopia and dystopia have a certain attraction to them that's very difficult to, to mitigate. But I think that's what we can do by trying to engage with these real spaces rather than the imaginary and the uncertain. And I, I think to some degree, just in to, to respond to the second part of Patrick's question about what, in what ways people might actually resist such a shift, uh, 
it's in in some ways the answer is it's 2020 uh like we've already encountered so many things that have made us horribly uncomfortable that have made us uh rethink the ways in which we live our lives in all sorts of um um different ways and i think now we are really starting to all be kind of much more like this this shift of the first world so to speak to having to move to online has meant that we've had to engage with questions that we haven't necessarily made time for or discussions that people have just you know people people have been talking but not everyone has been listening and so i think it's really important now that actually we continue to have these discussions and we continue to bring them up in a kind of uh, a forthright way and it's really you know we've seen various movements towards like lgbt QIA plus rights towards uh, race issues, towards um, global inequality in all of its different forms. And I think there's also something to be said about this idea of, I mean, you brought up this point about um, uh, the first world and the third world and the second world all being overlaid. I think you know, there's an example from way back when of the when the first 3D gun, 3D printed gun came out, and that the, how how do you actually um, uh, do legislation for that kind of issue? Because the way that it was being distributed was being online. So where are the servers held? You know, this is a discussion from 10 years ago, but already we we got rid of geographical boundaries a while ago and and the discussion starts to become about this kind of globalized experience about how all of these things can be connected and just to link it to bob's question bob bob posted a question what new and emergent technologies are people most interested in by this new representation of space and heterotopias in relation to process of digital to physical? To me, I think the answer just is whatever tools are needed to have this discussion. I don't know how what you all think, but to me, it, um, in some ways, this discussion about which tool is the right tool is one from a few years ago now as well. And it's just, it's, it's just about um, using whatever is at your disposal to really try and investigate things and to try and really get the most out of what the, what those tools have. Uh, I think that some tools lend themselves better than others to various modes of communication. But to say that online or, uh, I don't know, Mozilla Hubs or this thing is the right tool for a discussion about heterotopias, I think is, is missing the point slightly. I think you just have to take whatever tool is most useful to you and then, yeah. Maybe Rory, you'd like to yeah, jump in no, to wrap us up on that. Yeah, I think, I think that's a that's a you know the point is everybody around this virtual space here has is using a different set of tools and has a different uh, view on that question. Right? And it's a question that we're asking ourselves um, constantly, and it changes sometimes. It you know it can change in a heartbeat when you suddenly see something that just suddenly unlocks another or maybe way of seeing the world or creating a world, and. Um, that's extremely exciting. It also creates a certain sense of sort of fear of missing out by always looking over the shoulder of somebody next to you who's got the, the newest piece of kit or, you know, the, 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 the most recent version of a, a piece of software and suddenly they're doing something that you can't, you've not done. And it creates a bit of an arms race sometimes, which is, has its challenges. Uh, whether you're an industry or you're an academia, an individual practitioner, or you're working in a large company with a range of skilled technicians, but it's it is an interesting problem. I mean, I just to, I just to bring us back to that, I, I think I think the constraints thing is is actually an excellent thing to bring in here. You know, um, what's what's really interesting now is that people are armed so to speak in this arms race usually with all manner of various different components and whether you're like a fine art painter and you're using paint to uh, to enter into this discussion or whether you're having some kind of uh, high-tech super studio production i think all of those discussions have different things to say about it and i think that's why it's really important to maintain this kind of transdisciplinary approach and to have this radically inclusive discussion but I think that that is the, the, the key question here is, and that might also kind of help us go away from the fear of missing out, is that it doesn't just lie within one of us or in with one tool, one component, but it is the constant engagement across all of these with each other, having these conversations and understanding that this is a collaborative effort across humans and all other sentient and non-sentient beings. And I like to kind of refer to Catherine Hales, who calls this the global cognitive ecology, 
And I really like this term because she talks about cognition as residing in something that we all share in this way. This includes plants, humans, foxes, and technologies. And it is something that I think that we should keep at the heart is that whatever we're doing, we're not doing in isolation. And so we should do this collectively um, together to actually consider how we go forward, um, not as individuals, but as kind of as a global team. Yeah, I agree. We're not fi we, we we might be physically distanced, but we're not socially distanced, actually. And, that, and actually yeah. on that point, I think I should just wrap up by saying come and visit our hub, come see the work of the students and the staff. We'll be there. Um, and that's a place to continue the conversation. And of course, you can find us at interactivearchitecture.org and all the various social media handles that go with it. Thank Get you very much. Everybody. This has been a wonderful conversation. It's been a huge pleasure. And thank you, Stephen, for, for hosting it and Fiona for organizing. And of course, Oslik.